before we get started, just congrats on the new record. It's it's just awesome. Thank you. I'm really digging it. Thank you. Yeah, me too, man. I. Uh, it's funny how coming through the pandemic and and you know here we are basically starting to be on the other side of it. It's a good time to take stock of what has happened and where you've been. And uh, I listened to the I listened to the record the other night and I felt uh proud of the fact that for such a chaotic time it's it's a reasonably chill statement right it's pretty balanced and if there's yeah. anything I, if there's anything that i think is opposite of what i expected it's that <laughs> well well let's let you know i want to go ahead and get started here with you and and um the funny thing is i was looking thinking about questions and and uh you know what to ask you and talk about and uh the funny thing is the last concert i saw before everything went down was y your show with <laughs> uh in orlando it yeah. was i don't know, march 7th i want to say it was something like that right before we shut it down yeah then then like right the next we week it, it was yeah man it was pretty wild yeah and it's funny because although it has you say you know it's been three years it, uh, it, it, time really is relative depending on what you're experiencing right because that whole seismic shift in human <laughs> consciousness just went by in a flash and it was the longest flash ever yeah i mean you found a way to keep uh really busy though you were one of the first i think kind of right out of the gate with live streams and your twitch channel and and all sorts of you did a podcast i mean you were really busy how did you find that time in you know was it like you felt like i have to do something or i'm gonna go crazy or or it was like oh i can finally get to these things i was trying to do i mean how how was that for you somewhere in between i think a part of it was on a practical level i'm thinking okay i got a family to support and i am in an industry that's rapidly d disintegrating. So how does one pivot uh, this work so that you can continue? But also, and almost more importantly for me is, I felt as many of us did very affected by the, the social discord and the, um, and the chaos of it all and the confusion of it all and the fear and all these things. And, I was surrounded by people that felt similarly and I did recognize that by playing music for people and by doing these things on some level uh it helped me cope with it and then the hope is that by proxy it would help you know somebody else perhaps and so it was it was really a a matter of of that at first but then the momentum started uh, accumulating with it and then one thing led to another and then by doing one stream there was interest in doing another and then um, I had the idea for the puzzle which became a compulsion and and then I moved and renovated which was also crazy and so all these things that happened as intense and as frenetic as they may have seemed on the surface I think were in my mind at least they were things that I, I just felt like I needed to do right and I don't think it went much further than that at the time. Yeah. I mean, it was a real fertile time for a lot of musicians, uh, you know, some more than others that you had all these reunions and you had all this, this kind of other stuff coming out. So in one way, just the, the music fan in me was sort of inundated with all this great stuff. And, <laughs> and that, that part of it was cool, you know, yeah. Um, but I particularly enjoyed uh, the, the shows that you did. And I think it allowed people to see you in a different way. I mean, the one concert, uh, I, I'll call it a concert, uh, I mean, where you were in your studio and you had the three cameras set up and you were playing all the stuff and operating all the cameras. I mean, it was it was pretty <laughs> darn impressive. It wasn't <laughs> like some guy with with a, you know, a GoPro just strumming an acoustic. I mean, it was a, it was a <laughs> elaborate what? thing. You know, it's like, um, first off, thanks. But I think a lot of times as well, like if I'm doing something and then it spurs another idea, uh, the compulsion to follow those those thoughts is really 
uh, gratifying to me. I enjoy that. And whether or not that's on a musical level, you are following a certain avenue and then you have another thought that veers you off in another direction. I enjoy that too. But after the first uh, stream, I started thinking, okay, it was cool, but this was a problem and this was a problem. And how do we sort this? And then by sorting that, you get these ideas. It's like these, the technologies that start to come together, whether or not it was, you know, the, the <laughs> turning a video game controller into a camera switch. And then right. from there, it's like, well, how do you make the crossfades? And then you, you get a piece of software that deals with the crossfades, but it also offers you the opportunity to try something else. And then before you know it, it snowballs. And <clears throat> there's a certain, there's a certain aspect of that uh, sort of creative snowballing that that I really I live for in some ways. So my wife and some friends are like, you know, you you're making this hard on yourself by going. The, and I and I agree, but at the same time, it's you've got all this new technology, and on some level, I just found it irresistible. I'm like, well, what if we tried this? And which it's this? fun. It's fun. It's it's what a it new is. creative creativity for you, right? I mean, that's. That's what it was. Yeah, it's, it's cool. <laughs> there are uh, certain things that work better than others. You know, the fan was a little quick for the camera, but, yeah, right. <laughs> but it was fun, man. Yeah. No, that was great. Um, well, I mean, of course, we got to talk about the new record, uh, Light Work. Um, comes out October 28th. The first single, Moon People, is out now with a, with a video that, that you made yourself, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. You know, you described the album as... Um, kind of being approached with your love of of simpler pop music i found your influences uh very interesting because they're very much the same as mine you know as much as i uh we, you know we have the prog report and we we cover all the prog bands and, and all that kind of stuff my favorite bands growing up were def leppard tears for fit like literally the same things totally. you were talking about totally man and and uh and i still i love that music right now you know one of my favorite records of the past year was the new tears for fears record which i thought amazing. was amazing Great record. amazing record yeah. yeah so um but how did that bridge into you then sitting down and writing because at some point it's it's still your mind it's still it's still devin townsend writing a song right so how do you say i want to approach this like that and then change your writing into being that if that makes sense it does make sense and and i would say that's not really how i do it um that's that's much more analytical than i fear i i actually <laughs> am. i always have a guitar around me well for the most part like like i have one in my bedroom and i have one here and I have one in the living room it's 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 been my default for many years to just constantly twiddle away on the guitar when i'm talking to somebody or when i'm thinking or when i'm and the result of that is music is constantly being written. And the sphere of influence for any of that is whatever's happening in that period. So I guess we could, if we're to analyze it further, it's directly affected by what happened prior. So because the puzzle was such an abstract and, and complex thing, um, it's inevitable that the the follow-up to that would be kind of its opposite. The same thing happened with Alien and Synchestra or or Deconstruction and Ghost. It's it's like I get so focused on right. actualizing a certain style that once I'm done, I'm like, okay, I need a break from that. And then what's refreshing to me is to go in another direction. And so the to take it further, I guess those uh, latent desires to participate in music that is more like the Tears for Fears or, or Def Leppard is something that has been in there since the beginning, but perhaps due to the pandemic and due to the isolation of it, it gave me more of a chance to be at peace with that, as opposed to having a thought about, oh, that's a cool song, it's sort of a synth wave, sort of a vibe, and then thinking, well, I can't do that though, because because I'm typically known for being heavier or more complex or I, and I, I, I would say also to, the, to finish this answer is um, the thing I'm most uh, grateful for in my career is the ability to do whatever I want, you know? Totally. Yeah. And I think the criteria for that is not flippant either. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to do this because I can. It's, 
I'm going to do this because I feel compelled to go in that direction. And even if it doesn't fit into the mold of what people expect from me or, 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 or anybody really, it's, it's just such a great feeling to know that if I feel strongly about a certain musical direction, the thing that is going to appeal to the audience for the most part is, is typically been the authenticity of the intention behind it. And so, you know, this is another example of that. There's yeah, no I mean, freedom. I noticed that with with uh, the first single when yeah. uh, the comments, I mean, were I, I feel like a hundred percent positive. There wasn't, I, I didn't see anyone. Maybe there was one in there, but I, I didn't see anything. It was like, you know, what the hell is this crap or something? You know. It, no, you know what's funny is, well, sorry to interrupt, but as somebody told me something the other day, it was funny. They said that they were. Because I don't look at comments, right? It's just it's not good it's for my idea, yeah. <laughs> it's bad idea, right? <laughs> but some uh, people said, you know, uh, for the most part, people like what you're doing. And said, Every now and then, you'll get somebody that is like, you know, fuck this shit. We should be doing should be doing strapping again. But he said the funny thing about it is the usernames for those comments are typically like blinded by internal pain or you know <laughs> right. something you know and i think that when i was 25 years old i was right with you man i was blinded by internal pain or <laughs> but at 50 i'm just not right it's not like i don't feel pain it's not like i don't feel anger but i mean saw a comic the other day that also described this perfectly for me it's a picture of somebody coming up to somebody else saying you've changed and the person's just like yeah that's what we're supposed to do yeah duh you're supposed yeah. to change like <laughs> you haven't come on <laughs> uh well you know it's sort of weird to also give the impression that you made kind of a tears for fears record like it's not you know it's very much still heavy guitars and uh and there's some still weird stuff on you know on the back end of the record i mean you're still going from a track like dissonance to a track like vacation which you know people eventually will hear but um and so i think part of the interesting nature of your music music is not just whether it's heavy or complicated it's the the specific diversity of doing one style versus this style, putting them all on the same record, that, that kind of thing. I mean, the same could be said for um, uh, uh, Why and, and uh, you know, and then the Hear Me or whatever, the, uh, the other heavy song, putting those back to back, you know, on the last record. I mean, that, that's right. That already makes that interesting for me. Well, I, I like the word interesting more so than, than strange, because I think there's some people that view disparate interest musically as being indicative of some sort of dysfunction but to me it's the opposite it's it's what i would view more as a dysfunction is doing one thing to the exclusion of everything else it's it's that doesn't interest me right and i will give credit where credit was due for um garth who was involved with this record with me where while he was going through the material that i presented him he he thought it was a really important step to include things that were all uh varied right uh stylistically and uh, the last interview I, I just did he he had mentioned he's like it doesn't make sense to me how you can go from one vocal style to another how you can go from screaming metal to operatic or or what have you and and my answer to that was the same as i'm saying to you it's i just have different interests mm -hmm. and I've been doing this long enough that they're all, it's technique. It's not, um, <laughs> it's not indicative of, of mental illness, for example, <laughs> to, to be interested in different styles of music. And I actually think it's, it's kind of telling that overwhelmingly, it seems like that's the, that's the diagnosis in this day and age. If you do things that are different, it's like, well, clearly there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you well, know I, think, I, mean? I think, I think, you know, being, uh, I don't know what the right word is, adult, mature, older, whatever, that, you know, allows you the, the opportunity to like and, and do other things. I, I remember being told when I was younger, like a teenager from, from another friend at the time that were, I think I was talking about liking, I don't know, two bands that were completely different. And I was told, well, you can't like both of those, you know, that's, and that's very much a 13 year old kind of opinion, I think. 
Precisely. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's also, I think it's also a rite of passage to, to make peace with that within yourself as well. I, I, I think if you're, if your self-worth as an artist is based on everybody liking you, it's, it's, it's problematic. And, and, um, part and parcel of, of taking the step away from that is accepting that maybe what you're going to do isn't going to appeal to some of the people who liked it in the beginning. And there's a lot of people that maybe were drawn in by city or alien or, 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 or anything that I'd done back then, ocean machine even, who now listen to what I do and they say, well, this isn't for me. And that's fair enough. And I think that those types of reactions are, are completely appropriate. I think the things that are confusing is when people don't understand why people have changed. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. And, um, but all you can do is just be true to yourself. And if you have, if you felt like you've changed to not honor that within yourself is incredibly unhealthy. You know, it's like, if you've changed fundamentally in terms of what your likes and what your dislikes are and, and you and you don't act on that. You just keep pretending that you are who you were when you were younger. I think eventually it's like number one, people are going to be aware. They're going to say something's something doesn't line up with this statement. And I just think that you're going to be you're going to give yourself an ulcer. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little about the concept for the record. So uh, you have the whole lighthouse thing, and and that's a theme in the video. Um, yeah. You know, talk about that and and what that all means, and and it, it, does that tie in through the through the material also, like lyrically, or or is it just more of a overall kind so. of concept? I think it would tie in. I mean, I don't. Uh, I I've said this before as well, but the way I write lyrics tends to be more reductive than anything else. Like I don't come into it saying this is a song about cats. <laughs> you know, it's just I write, and then I know when the lyrics. Are speaking to me when I feel a certain way and sometimes the the words themselves can be sort of abstract or even nonsensical but if they make me react in a certain way then I know it's it's right but the lighthouse was for me uh because the period in which this record was put together written recorded mixed everything was just so fraught with unexpected drama and chaos and conflict and 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 stress high anxiety right and uh i think there's probably a lot of people that can relate to this over the past year and i always viewed the creative catalyst that draws musicians or artists to create as being something that's really special and so the analogy for that was the the lighthouse, I guess. The in the midst of of an unrelentingly negative time, keeping my mind on that creative catalyst that is music, uh, it sort of guide guides or guided me through a, a, a storm on a personal level, and you know it's 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 really a good uh, move for me on each record that I start to identify a central theme, whether or not it, it plays into the lyrics, having something that I can hang my hat on. Uh, it's like you fill in the blanks. So in the same way that writing lyrics tends to be reductive, so does identifying the theme. It starts with an emotional response where I have a feeling that I wanna, I wanna articulate but it's feelings are it's difficult to put it into words it's like you know you can't say oh it's love or hate or trains or or it's just it's a thing and so the way that i have typically tried to identify and articulate those moments of significance is just i'll try things out you know i'll write a bunch of music and i'll go down a rabbit hole and oftentimes it yields nothing but you've got music that is a result there, which often comes out as the bonus disc, night work or yeah, we'll talk or, about that too, but yeah. Or anything, yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you do find something that scratches the itch, I think the first one on this was Equinox. I remember when that one was written, I remember thinking, yeah, there's something about that song that 
is ringing true. And then I sort of try to figure out what it is about it. Is it the synth content? Is it the mellow vocal? Is it the echo guitar? Is it the, is it the emotional intensity? Is it like, what is it? And then it just starts to refine itself and I start writing more in that avenue. And then I work hand in hand with the artist. And then they keep sending me images that I could have on my desktop. So while I'm writing, I'm looking at it. And then it just, just by removing things that aren't right, eventually you land upon something. And then it's typically in the last moments of, of, uh, of a project where I'm able to identify, I'm like, oh, this one's about conflict resolution. This one's about death. This one's about confusion. This one's about whatever it, it's, it's relationships. It's, and then, uh, then I feel that as a result of creating it, I learned what I needed to learn from that period, and then the next period will be different. That's great. And then you mentioned night work, so you have a whole disc here, bonus disc of, I mean, you, you consider it like bon bonus material, or it's just stuff that didn't make the record, or? Yeah, in light of what I just described with the process, I mean, I just write tons of music. And then when it comes time to trying to identify the uh, the overarching sort of ethos of a certain period, I go through that music. I say this one, that one, this one, that one. And then I start to refine those. And in this case, I did it with Garth. And, uh, and then whatever's left over, I just finish. And then it's more material. And some people have commented that there's some songs on the, on the bonus disc that they prefer uh, to the main record and a lot like off of empath or transcendence or casualties. And I don't disagree with that. However, it's almost like it didn't fit for some reason, even though it might be a more uh, appealing song in the scope of, of the main theme. It just kind of, I found it distracting. So, right. So that's kind of where the decisions. Well, I wanted to ask you that about the sequencing of the tracks. Uh, was that a challenge for, for this one as well? Because, I mean, I don't know if nor, traditionally Moon People is like, is sort of like an opening song type thing, but I mean, at least in the scope of like your music, but it works for this record, you know what I mean? For sort of setting yeah. the table. Was that a challenge, sort of like a puzzle, you know, figuring out where all these go? It always is. And I think the identity of the record went through a bunch of shifts and, and the most jarring one was in the 11th hour so i delivered the record finished it sent it off to sony went on tour for three months landed in vancouver on the way back to the tour and got five emails uh from the label from management saying the one song in the middle of the record which was ultimately replaced by heartbreaker we can't put on the record because we can't get the right for a sample so in the 11th hour, after I had thought that the record had been delivered, I had to remove a song called Honey Bunch, which Che sang on. It was really commercial. Niall Rogers, a guitar player, plays on it. It was really an interesting, uh, interesting moment in the record. But we had to remove it, and I had nothing else. So I had to go home after all this time and sort of put together Heartbreaker and, and mix it at the 11th hour. So the structure of the record got a little skewed somewhere along the line, but I think that all these projects are lessons for me in nothing is perfect. You can only do your best with any particular moment and, and you can't control it in the ways that you would like to. And within the parameters of that, you, you do the best you can and that's what you did. And so the sequencing of the record had been established early on and moon people was always and this was garth's idea it was always the first song but it went in a bunch of very different directions originally but if i'm being honest towards the end of the recording after i had moved house and renovated and been on tour and all the chaos i sat with the record and i was like this isn't working for me this, it's not right for me. And that became very problematic because I had a whole team of people that were like, yeah, this is what we've decided. This is what it's going to be. And so when I finally was like, guys, I, I need to rethink this. You know, it was, uh, there were some heavy moments there, let's just say. But uh, at the end of the day, 
it's my record and you have to do what's going to be right for you on it. And part of the process of this record was learning that as disappointing as that can be for others, if you have to make that decision for yourself and your work, you got to be prepared to make those calls, right? Yeah. I mean, hey, for whatever it's worth, the record sounds great. I agree. You know, the songs are the songs are fantastic. Heartbreaker is great. Yeah. Um, uh, the production, again, I mean, this is something that's been for the last many records is just insanely good. Thank you. Um, so you have that part down. I mean, <laughs> was, well, was it I, easier this time? Less instrumentation, sort of giving everything more space? I mean, I, I kind of feel like that might have been the thing. Well, I had a co-producer on this with Garth Richardson, right? And he right. Um, he's uh, he's had a long resume and he's an excellent producer. So it wasn't easy for him either because I'm not, uh, I'm not a, you know, it's unstoppable force and immovable object, man. It's like, it's pretty intense. So both of us had to make some concessions, but uh, he certainly helped with clearing it out and, and making some uh, decisions in terms of the production to, to make it a little bit more um, linear and, 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 you know, it, it's, he's, he's exceptionally skilled at what he does. And so as much as it was a co-production, um, uh, he really, really uh, helped me in that regard. So I'll share the credit with him for this one. Yeah. And so you're getting ready to go on tour soon. And um... thankfully not yet. Right. Thankfully not yet. I had to put the brakes on it because the past couple of years of activity was so frenetic for me that I, I frankly burnt out. So I've spent the last couple of months just trying to build the studio, trying to get myself back together uh, psychologically and physically. Uh, it, it was a it was a, a pretty intense year, and 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 things kind of got a little loosey goosey, right? Um, but uh, February is when it all starts up again. Yeah. So at this point, I'm just getting the studio ready, finishing all the the work that goes into. Um, uh, you know, I got to finish the video for Call of the Void today, and then I do interviews. But February is when it starts, and and uh, I think it's going to be really cool. I'm I'm just just about to start strategizing what I want to do live for the next run, and I I'm excited about it actually, which is odd <laughs> for me. Uh, it's gonna be great. I hope uh, I hope you come down this way again, Florida, and um, and I get a chance to see see the show. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, light work comes out October twenty eighth. Uh, check out the track Moon People now. There'll be some more stuff coming out over the next few months, and uh, really? uh, follow up for tour dates and all that. Man, great talking to you, buddy. And uh, good luck with the record. I think everybody's gonna gonna really like it. Thank you, brother. It's good talking to you again. And take care of yourself. And uh, um, uh, I love the backdrop of CDs, man. Because in the beginning, I, I, it's got to be green screen. Right? <laughs> it is. It is. Oh, it's it's just, it is my cd tower but it's just a picture of it to, i thought <laughs> it looked nicer than the mess behind me it's cd section man That's i'll talk right. to you soon <laughs> all right buddy